pachinko, as you may know, is a $203 billion industry in Japan. So it's actually a cornerstone of actually the Japanese economy. It's one of these important aspects of it. And one out of 11 people in Japan play pachinko. That said, this entire book is actually not about that game. It's about the people who actually dominate the industry and who are the Korean Japanese people. Um, this book is actually a four generation saga of one family, one Korean family in Japan, and it starts in 1910 and it goes until 1989, which is actually the year that I learned about the Koreans in Japan. So it's kind of a personal point of stopping because that's when I actually started. So I ended it when I started. Um, I wanted to explore the Koreans in Japan because they are an absolutely unknown quantity pretty much around the world but it's a group that has been really important to me and I think it became important to me because when I was in college I actually learned about them and I had no idea about the history of it even though I was a history major so I ended up studying this community and I kind of fell in love with their sense of resistance and their struggle of how difficult it was for them, despite all the aspects of history, and then they created an amazing, amazing world. And they, you know, there are about six hundred thousand um, Japanese Korean Japanese in Japan today. Oh, sure. Yeah, when I was um, a junior in college, I went to a lecture where there was an American missionary. And he talked about the Koreans in Japan, and I knew nothing about it. And I went to the lecture only as a favor to a friend, because no one wanted to go. Because I think when you're a junior in college, you're thinking, oh, I really want to hear an American missionary talk. So I went anyway, and there were about three of us, including the speaker. It's really mortifying, so I couldn't leave. And he was actually great. You know, this is like another uh, uh, announcement for undergraduates to go to lectures by people who come. <laughs> and. He was really great, and he started talking about the entire history of the Koreans in Japan, which I knew nothing about them. And then when I went there, I thought, you know, this is really cool. I didn't know that, that the Koreans in Japan came pretty much during the occupation era, and I didn't know that they were really oppressed. That said, it just felt like another sad history, and of course, like when you're young, you kind of think you know everything. And I thought I definitely knew everything. And he told us this one story about this young boy who was 13 years old, who had climbed up to his apartment building and he leaped to his death. And his parents were naturally devastated and they wanted to understand why their son committed suicide. So they went through all of his things and they found a middle school yearbook in which his classmates had written a lot of really amazingly heinous things. They had written that he should go back to where he belongs, that, um, he smells like garlic, they hated him, and they wrote the words, die, die, die. And of course, we learn that the young boy was born in Japan. He's ethnically Korean, but he's culturally Japanese. His parents are also born in Japan, and they're just working class people who wanted to raise their family there. And they're also products and accidents of history because they really couldn't go back to Korea after the war. So I heard this story and it really, really made a huge impact on me, so much so that it basically, I spent 30 years writing this book. Um, what I do think is sort of relevant today is I kept on wondering why is it that I had to keep returning to that story because this book is not about suicide, it's not about depression or, or about bullying. This book is really about one family and how they really struggle for generations. and. I think that it comes down to the fact that I'm a Korean American. I wasn't born in America. I came when I was seven years old. I'm a naturalized citizen. And throughout my entire life, I've been so uh, intensely supported, so kindly supported by so many Americans that I think that I have a sense of entitlement. Like, I think people shouldn't be treated this way. I wasn't treated this way. And I really like Japan so much in so many ways. And it was very hard for me to accept that you can have this really great country and you can also have the social norm that where you believe that certain people are beneath you, that they are morally suspect, and that they are unacceptable in so many different ways. So that pol um, polar 
experience of actually having great people and a loathsome idea was something that I really had to work through. And I still am working through it because that happens, I think, all the time, even in America, where you can have an amazing person and they can say something really heinous. And you're kind of thinking, how do I put this together? So part of my struggle with this book was trying to understand the, um, the dual nature of, I guess, good and evil within people. Oh, that's a really good question. No one's ever asked me that before. Um, because it's just a tiny segment of the book, mm -hmm. and it's very funny because it's a tiny segment of the book because th the little boy that I heard about is not a main character in this book. He's actually a character that a Japanese police officer learns about. And it was very important for me, whenever I think about a story and how I work through things that really, I guess, spark my imagination, I always wonder the most important question I think for a fiction writer is from whose point of view? So if you hear about that story, who's going to tell that story? And for me, I didn't want to tell it from the parent's point of view. I certainly didn't want to tell it from the boy's point of view, and you can do that. I wanted to tell it from a police officer's point of view who was deeply sympathetic to the Koreans in Japan because in my experience, I met so many Japanese people who were so sympathetic to the Koreans. At the same time, you have this majority culture that says it's okay to think that they are morally suspect, criminal, deceitful, untrustworthy, shifty, lazy. I mean, you just name it. I've heard everything about the Koreans in Japan. And yet, there were so many Japanese who were in positions of power who felt very vulnerable to the fact that they too could be affected. And in my situation, the Japanese police officer and the detective, is he is secretly gay. And I also interview people who are secretly gay in Japan because to be gay in Japan is not an easy path either. So I was able to work through it in that way. Oh, it's really nice to think of it as a pioneer. I actually just thought that I was wasting my time. Um, this entire period when I was working on this, I kept on looking for these books mm -hmm. written originally in English and I couldn't find them. There are actually, there's one translation of a Korean Japanese novel, which is in English now, but it's in translation. But originally in English, there aren't any. And when I was working on it, I didn't think, oh, I'm a pioneer. I actually thought, why am I doing this? This is really crazy. And also the law is so complicated in this field because the immigration laws change constantly the social services law co changed constantly, and even though I was an attorney, I would look at these documents and I'd just be like, oh my goodness. So what ended up happening was I had to learn all the wars, all the laws, and then I had to forget it because the fiction reader doesn't want to know. But I had to know that it was accurate because I felt certain that someone would kind of say, no, that didn't actually happen then. So for example, the fingerprinting issue, that law changed in 1993. You don't see it in this book because it doesn't matter. However, at the time that it actually occurs in this book, it did occur. And the entire protest and the demonstrations that were related to fingerprinting, I knew about it and I learned about it. However, it isn't important for the reader to know. But I did feel very strongly, and I think part of this comes from my history background, that I did have to know it thoroughly. But it took so much time. <laughs> and I kind of thought, and this is like, I wonder what people think about this like pioneer idea. <laughs> It's very flattering, is that when something doesn't exist, is it because nobody wants it? Or is it because it shouldn't happen? Or because if it's just too difficult to do? Like, I, I didn't think it was the last item. I actually kind of thought maybe nobody wants it, nobody really cares about it. There's only 600,000 Korean Japanese in the world right now. It's a micro community, if you think about the global aspect of it. Why should people care? Because there's discrimination everywhere. And why are these people so important? But to me, they were really important. And I thought, if this book doesn't work out, then at least I'll have finished it. And I have to tell you, when I finished this book, it was great. I just felt like, oh, I'm done. <laughs> the sentence is lifted. <laughs> but I'm really glad that it's being read and people really enjoy it as a book as opposed to just um, as a history idea. So that's very gratifying.
it's funny because I think I had had wishes to be an academic, to be a scholar of history. I didn't pursue that path because that path seemed incredibly long and I think I got discouraged because when I was a history major at Yale, I found support in certain aspects of my department, but not everywhere. So academically, I wasn't an A student. Like I didn't graduate summa cum laude at, at Yale. And as a matter of fact, in my public high school, I really didn't understand how to write academically until probably my junior year. <laughs> and even then it was really difficult for me. So I, I wasn't an academic writer, which is like a really amazingly difficult, strong, it's hard to learn. And it took me a while. Um, anyway, going back to this wish to be a historian, I think that it naturally appealed to me that this topic would create all these questions that I wanted to tackle. And I did tackle them. So I ended up doing a lot of interviews. I looked at a lot of primary documents, which was not Perhaps it's not a great idea to do that, to write fiction, because it'll just take that much longer. I reviewed a lot of anthropology, sociology. I read a ton of books. I probably read, looked at every major book about the Korean Japanese that was in English. And they're actually acknowledged in the back because what I couldn't believe was how much work they had done and how so few people had read these works. So I hope that, you know, if if people are interested in this topic, they can look in the back and look at all the major scholars because they have spent their entire lives just distilling all this information for, you know, regular consumption. And they're really well-written books that should get more attention. But going back to this whole idea of writing a historical novel, I had no intention of writing a historical novel. So the first manuscript that I finished about the Korean Japanese people was not a historical novel. As a matter of fact, um, I thought that I was going to write a novel about 10 years. Be between the 70s and 80s, and that was going to be it. It was going to be really short. And I thought, and then I'll be done. <laughs> and then I moved to Japan, and I had such a shocking experience where I felt like, oh, that manuscript that I had finished in 2000, I think, three, that I couldn't publish because it wasn't very good, failed because I had not written a novel. I had written kind of a treatise and a pamphlet, a very long pamphlet. And by pamphlet, I mean in the sense of like an 18th century pamphlet where people wanted to give ideas and argue a point. And I was didactic and I was trying to say, oh, this is really wrong and people shouldn't do this in a form of a drama. But it wasn't that way. Because when I met the Korean Japanese, they didn't see themselves as historical victims, not even a little bit. And consequently, they gave me the gift of the line the first line of the book, which is, history has failed us, but no matter. Because in every interview that I had with a Korean Japanese person, they made it very clear to me that they didn't see themselves as victims. They were very clear that certain things happened that they don't like, certain laws were really unfair, but their attitude was, but you move on, you work through it. And they were never, ever binary in the sense of they would say, oh, the Japanese are bad and the Koreans are good, because they would be very forthcoming about Koreans who are bad and Japanese who are good. And having that experience forced me to rethink everything that I knew and started to write about the stories of people as opposed to the history uh, facts, which often talk about who won and who lost. It's really discouraging. Yeah. I think working on a novel for a very long period of time, it's very discouraging because you don't know why you're doing it, even though you know why you're doing it. You're doing it because you want to and because this question is interesting to you, but then you kind of wonder, well, what are you expecting? So very often, I think you have to almost forget the outcome. Like, I always kind of think it's like being a sports psychologist. Being a sports psychologist would be very helpful to <laughs> think about being a writer, is that you want to practice and you want to do your work, but you can't think about the outcome because if you think about the outcome, then you're going to miss the entire point of writing. Like I think if you really wanted to be a fiction writer or any kind of writer, any kind of scholar, you do it because you like it, because you enjoy it, because you think it's important. I guarantee that you will not be happy every day. <laughs> and I think that's important to not think of it being making you happy all the time. I think that's kind of an immature way to think about anything that's worth doing. But I do think it's important to think about 
the fact that you like moving the sentences around. You like looking for the active verb and you like thinking about the message that you want to send. And I think that all those things are in constant operation when you're working on a book for a really long time. And while you're doing it, I think it's also important to be a, a good person. And that's a weird thing for me to say, but I want to say it because in the arts, there's a real focus on do whatever you want to do if it's going to create the book. I disagree. I don't think you should burn relationships with your family members, hurt your children, um, not pay attention to the needs of your community. I think all those things are important to becoming an artist that's creating work that's worth doing. So being a writer and being a mother and a, and a wife and a friend and a daughter, all those things are part of my life. So part of the reasons why I have all this delay is because I had to take care of all of my immediate and um, distant communities. And I feel very strongly that I have a sense of responsibility to more people than just my work. I guess, you know, Sanja didn't really appear, the main character, until 2007. So I know that sounds not a long time ago, but if you think about the fact that I started this book in my head in 1989, really started in 1996, the fact that the main character didn't come until 2007 is nuts. <laughs> but she came very, very clear to me when I moved to Asia, because when I was in Asia, all I did was meet all these ajumas. And ajumas are, it's a Korean word, which could mean ma'am, it could mean uh, married mother, uh, it could mean so many different things, but it basically means kind of an older woman who's mature. Um, and it could be somebody who's working class, it could be an honorific. But I met all these ajumas in Korea who are working all the time. And the, I realized how important their labor and the reasons why they labor were to me. And witnessing and meeting so many ajumas made me sort of rethink about the focus of this book because in initially the book is really about Solomon which is shocking, I think, for most people, but that's how the book really started. So if you look at the Missouri Review in 2002, the book was really supposed to be about Solomon, who works on Wall Street. And that's about, like, this much of the book right now. The entire book now goes all the way back to Sanja, and that's the reason why I had to throw the entire manuscript away, because I realized no, there is no Solomon without Sanja. There are no Solomons at all. There's no, there are no pachinko parlors without Sanja. And I realized, oh, that's so important that I have to go back all the way. And I, I had no intention of writing a book about an ajama and her children. <laughs> but then I met all these Korean Japanese and men and women all talked about this silent, hardworking, almost beast of burden. These ajamas are almost beasts of burden because they never get any credit. And what's important to notice is that my character is illiterate. Almost all these women were illiterate. And somehow, despite their illiteracy, despite the fact that they had no social status, they somehow raised these families. And I thought, oh, they do um, deserve another look. And I think that part of me was dismissive of their work. And until I met them, I realized, oh, I have to really rethink my sexism and my you know, classism because I didn't think this through. But now I was like, oh, Without them, there's really nothing. You know, it's funny because I think if someone told you that your lot is to suffer just because of your biology, I think even if you were a good girl or an obedient girl, which, which are messages that I think that Korean women get constantly. I mean, every single Korean folktale really focuses on obedience and being virtuous being sexually pure, all those stories. And, and that's fine. It's just part of the 5,000 year, years of history of Korea. But I do think that it's normal for any human being who's born in a modern society to kind of say, I don't, would rather not suffer all the time. <laughs> and I would rather not choose to suffer all the time. And when Sanja is internally grumbling, I think it's really normal. Because at the end of the day, she still does all the right things. And I wanted to acknowledge the grumbling versus the behavior. 
because we can grumble, we can also behave in a correct way. Do I think all women should suffer? Do I think all men should suffer? Of course not. But I think, do men and women suffer? Absolutely. I think you can't dodge it even if you wanted to. I don't think money, I don't think race, I don't think gender, and there isn't a, a factor that could protect you from suffering. And I think that the older I get, and I'm 48 now, the more I realize that everybody is suffering. And mostly people are privately suffering. So one of the practices that I think about constantly is to be gentle with people because you just don't know what they're going through. Like I've met so many people who are powerful and wealthy and strong and really good looking and you turn and it turns out that they're having cancer and you're going, oh, I didn't, I didn't know that. So you don't know. So one of the things that I get to do as an omniscient narrator is to actually explore the private suffering and the private joys of anybody in the room. And that to me is really fun. Like there are a lot of like annoying things about being a fiction writer. But for me, the really, really cool part is to get to inhabit the private lives of many people. Oh, that's really so interesting because I'm on this extensive tour and it's like a real gift to get to meet all these people who've actually read your book because it's a long book, but I've been getting a lot of testimonies. So I'll go to a reading and someone will come and they'll tell me that they read it and this is what they think. And they usually come out, not because they need to buy a book because they've already bought a book, but because they just kind of wanted to tell you something. And one of the most gratifying things is to have met Korean Japanese people who've come to my readings. Because I was really afraid when I was writing this book. I'm a Korean American from Queens, New York. And I lived in Japan. And when I was living as, in Japan, I was living as an expatriate, surrounded by mostly expatriates. I don't speak Japanese fluently. I speak it a tiny bit, and I had to hire translators, so I can't read Japanese. So I was const constantly anxious about how, how am I going to pull this off. And I think that anxiety made me work even harder at my homework. So then, but I, I was always kind of worried someone's going to come and say, you got that wrong. <laughs> but all these Korean Japanese have been coming up to me at readings and saying, I can't believe that you got this. How did you know this about my family? And I think, and they're very emotional, usually, when they come. And I, I, I get really emotional because they're emotional and then we're both like crying in some bookstore. <laughs> and, but it's very gratifying because I realize that they felt seen. And I think that one of the great things that a fiction writer can do is to make the reader feel seen. And I wanted to see them because they were really interesting to me. In the same way, when I read a book, and it may not be a, a book about Koreans, if I read Jane Eyre and I feel seen by Charlotte Bronte, I don't know if Charlotte Bronte was actually thinking, oh, one day a Korean American girl is going to think, oh, she'll feel seen. <laughs> but I think she really looked very, very deeply at herself and at other young women and the nature of having a crush on a you know, unavailable man, Mr. Rochester, and all those factors. <laughs> and it's a kind of a stage that pretty much any girl kind of probably goes through. But she was really honest about it. And I think that emotional honesty is something that I want to give the reader because I respect my reader. So when I do meet people at the readings, it's incredible. It's, it's an incredible experience. And I feel so lucky. And I think, oh, for this reason, I traveled 12 hours on a plane and was at a bookstore for 45 minutes. But then I get to meet this person, I think, oh, it's really amazing. So that's been probably the best part about the book tour. <laughs> um, Pachinko is part of a trilogy, hmm. and not, they're, they're not related. My characters aren't related in that sense, but to me it's a thematic trilogy. I'm calling it The Koreans. My first book, Free Food for Millionaires, is about the Koreans in America. My second book, Pachinko, is about the Koreans in Japan. And my third book is a thematic trilogy connection about the role of education for Koreans around the world. So the book is called American Hogwan, and it's going to be about hogwans that are in America that much replicate the cram schools that there are in Korea. And I'm questioning the role of education for Koreans around the world because although I think education is historically sound and a beautiful thing, 
I do think that the obsession about education and educational achievement is really hurting children. So I wanted to explore that in drama.